Uh, so cool. I never thought that, you know, when I was a kid that I'd ever get the chance to talk to Eric Bishop, but here I am, and I'm pretty excited for this one. I've got a lot of questions that I hope you haven't been asked too many times in the past. Well, manage your expectations. I hope this, uh, I hope I live up to them. <laughs> I'm sure you will. Um, well, first off, I'll just uh, ask you a few questions about the tour that's uh, coming up in Australia that's in uh, June. It's called 83 Weeks sure. with Eric Bishop, and it's a spoken word tour. Can you just tell people uh, what they can kind of expect if they're going to come to a show? Oh, you know, if I had to sum it up, it would be one part crazy comedy and the other part really interactive and informational. Um, you know, the wrestling industry, by its very nature, is over-the-top, bizarre characters, unique personalities, and the stories that we all have to share, those of us that have been in the business um, and, and, and seen the and live the life behind the scenes, the stories we have tend to be over the top, hilarious, crazy, and almost unbelievable. And it's always fun to share those stories. And I certainly have plenty of them that I don't talk about on the podcast for various reasons. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that, you know, half of the show is going to, you know, have people cracking up and laughing and, you know, having to use the restroom and, you know, just having a great time. Uh, but the other half of the show is, you know, the question and answer format gives us the opportunity to kind of peel back the curtain and talk about aspects of the, the wrestling industry that people have never heard before. Mm -hmm. Quite frankly, other than Vince McMahon, there's nobody out there that was as close to, you know, the, the, the center of the business of, of the wrestling business than me. And I, and I love sharing that aspect because most wrestling fans I've found over the years around the world who are, you know, really what I call hardcore wrestling fans mm -hmm. are really interested in not just what wrestling is, but how, you know, how it works. Why, do you, why did we make certain decisions and certain choices and, and what's all involved in actually, you know, running a wrestling promotion. So it's a, it's a combination of, you know, Great stories, a lot of humor, a lot of fun, but the interactive part, the Q and A part of the show, is very much about the inner workings of the business. And every time I approach one of these shows, I, I, I think about it in, in two ways. There's two goals that I have. One is my first goal is to entertain people. I want to make them laugh. I want to make sure everybody has fun. I want them to walk out of the event thinking, why well, I never thought that a show like this could possibly be that much fun. But I also want them to walk away with a better understanding of what went on during the Monday Night Wars and, and why we made the decisions we made and how we did certain things and, and, and the strategy and the tactics because it's a very fascinating part of the business for many, many people. For sure. Now, the next question I got, I thought I'd go right back to the very start of your career and just ask you, when did you first realize that you wanted to get into the wrestling business? Did you just start out as a fan and just got to work your way in with promotions and, you know, build your way up to the top? I never did. I, I never aspired to be in the wrestling business. I, I was always a fan of the wrestling business, but there was never a time in my life or a moment in my life even brief moment in my life that I ever aspired to try to get into the wrestling business. It really happened to a, a combination of, of, of um, just unique uh, timing uh, and coincidences. So I, I, I went into a meeting with an, a, a guy by the name of Vern Gagne, who was a wrestling promoter and producer in Minneapolis. I went into a meeting to make a sales presentation and he was impressed enough with my sales presentation that he offered me a job. And I, I went into that meeting, tried to sell one thing, and I came out with a new job and a new career. So that's how it happened. I, I never really aspired to get into the wrestling industry. It just kind of was thrust upon me, so to speak. Awesome. Well, uh, the next question I've got, I've actually uh, asked my friend because he's just he's like a walking encyclopedia with WWE 
NXT facts and oh, WCW facts and WWE knows it all. And uh, so I asked him to help me with a few questions. And one of the ones he wanted to ask was uh, your thoughts on Vince Russo and do you believe he was given too much creative control in WCW? Yeah, Vince Russo is a fraud uh, professionally and personally. Mm-hmm. He's a delusional, pathological liar. <laughs> wow. Beyond that, I, I I really don't have much to say about Vince Russo. Okay, well, uh, call that question answered then. Um, all right, so the next one is uh, I was going to ask you. There's a new wrestling federation that's come out. It's got uh, called AEW Wrestling. I know Chris Jericho, got some other people, uh, Badass Billy Gunn, some other pretty big names. Uh, just what are your thoughts on that as an enterprise? I'm very excited for them. I think the timing is absolutely perfect for what they're attempting to do. I think that they're a very well-funded company with some very smart people behind the scenes helping them to run the business of of that wrestling business. Uh, With people like Chris Jericho and Dennis Billy Gunn and and some of the new, you know, the Kenny Omegas and the Young Guns and Cody Rhodes, I think the combination and the profile of talent that they have is just amazing. And the fact that they're well-funded and the timing is perfect because I think the wrestling fans around the world are looking for an alternative to the WWE they have for a long time. Mm-hmm. And no one, no one has really had the, the resources to provide that alternative. And I think AEW does. I, I don't think the timing could be better. I don't think the situation could be better. Uh, I, I don't think the opportunity to be hugely successful has been as good as it is right now since the mid nineties. So I, I I'm very excited for them. I'm hopeful for them and, and I'm hopeful for fans that just love wrestling because it you know, it's been a big part of my life for the last thirty years and I like to see the industry survive and prosper and grow and continue to exist and I'm sure that it will. So I'm I'm nothing but excited. Sure. Uh, next question I want to ask, uh, one of my favorite wrestlers of all time is uh, Mick Foley, and I know he started out in the WCW. Um, I guess, were you kind of surprised when he became his name in WWE, saying it as though he didn't really do too well in WCW? No, I wasn't surprised. There were a lot of wrestlers that didn't do very well in WCW that went on to do well in WWE. You know, keep in mind, I came to WCW in 1991 as an announcer. Mm-hmm. I wasn't in management. I wasn't involved in creative. You know, Mick Foley was there when I got there. Evan Nash was there when I got there. Scott Hall was there when I got there. Steve Austin was there when I got there. And with the exception of Steve Austin, everybody had left and gone to WWE before or WWF before I ever got into management. So it wasn't that you know WCW was a very they were a struggling company when they hired me. They were a distant number two. They were a company that was losing millions and millions and millions of dollars every year when I got hired as an announcer. So it was WCW had a history of being dysfunctional, and it was no surprise that a lot of talent that left WCW, went on to WWE and become successful, including Mick Foley. Mick Foley, I think, is one of, he's one of my favorite people in the wrestling business. He's a good friend. Mm-hmm. I have nothing but a massive amount of respect for Mick Foley. And, and even to this day, Mick Foley is a very successful, um, you know, he's on tour all over the world. And he does an amazing job. He's a great storyteller. He's a great humanitarian. He does a lot of great things for charities. He's just a good human being. And people like that tend to end up being very successful no matter where they go. Sure. Uh, I know, like, there's a lot of wrestlers there that have had, uh, you know, chaotic lives. And there's some wrestlers that also, you know, I think wrestle far way beyond their prime. Have you? Is it ever hard having to talk to people that are, you know, kind of falling off the wagon, like Jake the Snake Roberts or, you know, uh, Scott Hall or people like that? I'm sure. I'm sorry. I didn't really. I didn't get your question. Could you ask that again, please? Uh, yeah. I was just wondering. Have you ever? I know you have to deal with a lot of wrestlers, and have you have to have to deal with ones going through, you know, personal problems, whether it's like, you know, Jake the Snake, uh, 
be drinking a bit too much or Scott Hall, people like that? Do you ever like have to mediate between problems in the wrestling industry? I don't think you know the wrestling industry. The wrestling industry is no different than any other industry in that regard. Mm-hmm. These are people that work for the federal government or for the governments um, in their respective countries that have those same issues. I think there are doctors that have those issues. There are lawyers that have those issues. There are teachers that have those issues. You know, issues like drug addiction and alcohol abuse um, are, are common throughout any vocation or profession. So. I don't think wrestling is any different. Of course, I had to deal with it, just like everybody does. Uh, and every situation is unique. It's, every situation is different and has to be handled differently. But it's it's just so common um, that I, I don't think wrestling is any different than anybody else in that regard. Definitely. And now the name of your tour that's called 83 Weeks, and that's based off the 83 weeks that uh, WCW was winning the Monday Night uh, Wars. And for a while, you guys really had the best talent on the planet. You know, Hulk Hogan, Ric Flair, Sting, uh, you know, Scott Hall, uh, the list goes on. Um, What were those weeks like where you're just at the top, you know, you're king of the castle, I guess? It's funny, you know, people have asked me that question before, and I've, I've tried in the in the past to reflect back and try to remember how I felt. And the truth is, I can't. I can't remember it because it all happened so fast. And I know, it, you know, 83 weeks is a year and a half, or almost two years. And one would think that if, if you're not in the moment, if you're not in that process, if you weren't a part of that period of time, and you were, you're a fan, you know, watching from the outside, it's easy, you know, for me to understand why one would think, well, how could you not remember what that was like? But if if you were in that moment and you were actually in the business at the time, I describe it as being on a treadmill that that's going at about 15 miles an hour. And if you're a runner, you know that's really fast. It's like on a treadmill that, that's going, you know, Top speed, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year for three and a half or four years. That's what it felt like. And when you finally get off that treadmill, you can barely remember what happened. Because it all happened so fast. So many things changed so quickly. So many things happened so quickly. The business itself changed so dramatically, so quickly. And in such a condensed period of time, that it all is just like one blurry memory. I remember it being exciting. I remember it being challenging. I remember it being frustrating. I remember it being the best time of my life. And I remember it being the worst time of my life. And that's about as close as I can get to try to communicate to people what it was really like. Yeah. And uh, as I just said before, you worked with some of the best talent, uh, Hulk Hogan, Ric Flair, uh, Vader. Um, who were some of the nicest people that you worked with, some of your best friends, and who were the more difficult wrestlers to work with, if you don't mind saying? Oh, wow. I mean, Ernest Miller, to this day, is still one of my best friends. Mm-hmm. Diamond Dallas Page, to this day, is still a very close friend. Uh, Hulk Hogan and I are still best friends to this day. Um, Booker T, Stevie Ray. I just got off the phone with Stevie Ray about an hour ago. Still one of my good friends. Um, a lot of people, you know, Sean Waltman, good friend. Kevin Nash and I are close. Scott, ha- Scott Hall and I are close to this day. Uh, so, I, you know, I've, I've maintained a lot of great relationships from the industry, and I'm very, you know, appreciative of that. In terms of, you know, some of the most difficult people that I've worked with, you know, Bill Goldberg was very difficult to work with, not because he's a bad person, not not for any other reason other than, you know, he, he came in green, mm-hmm. didn't know anything about the wrestling business, he was thrust into a, a, an amazingly high-profile position almost immediately. Uh, that can be overwhelming for anybody. And it took him a while to adjust to that. So that was very frustrating for him and for me. Uh, Scott Hall, even though he and I are very, in fact, Scott Hall, of all the people that I've worked with, 
Scott Hall is one of the people that I have. I know this is going to sound ironic, but I have the most respect for him because he's had he's had to overcome the most. Mm-hmm. And and we're close to this day, but during that period of time, he he probably gave me more gray hair than almost anybody. So, our next question I'll ask is just your thoughts on the current state of WWE. Um, I think for, as a fan, what I like about it most is I think the athleticism is probably better now than it's ever been. But the probably one thing I don't like quite as much is I find the storyline just really aren't that engaging to me anymore. I kind of just seem to fast forward to the matches these days. Uh, just what are your thoughts on the... WWE at the moment, what do you think they're doing right and what do you think they're doing wrong? Yeah, I, I don't want to suggest I know what to do. Uh, I think, you know, anything they're doing is wrong because they're, I mean, they're a $3 billion company. Yeah. more successful now than anybody would have ever imagined the wrestling company could be. They're a worldwide television entertainment phenomenon. I, I think it would be really hard for anybody to talk about what they're doing wrong. Now, it doesn't mean that I like everything they're doing, but there's a difference between what I like and what I appreciate and what's wrong. Yeah. Look, I, I agree with you 100%. I think the audience, a lot of what people need to understand is WWE will react to what the audience likes and what the audience wants. And for the last several years, this has been going on now for probably five or eight years. The super high flying, fast paced, super athletic presentation of wrestling is something that the audience has reacted to positively. So that WWE gives them more of that. Well, eventually, what people start to realize is yeah, but the storylines aren't there anymore. Because it's very hard to give the audience all that super fast paced, high flying athleticism and a good story. There's a balance. There's a middle ground between the two. And when all of your emphasis is is on the in-ring action and the athleticism, the tendency is to not worry as much or emphasize as much on the story until people start realizing, well, yeah, but where's the story? I, I agree with you. I'm one who's always, from the time I was a little kid, you know, growing up in Detroit, Michigan, I've always enjoyed the stories and the characters more than the action. I appreciate the action, and I enjoy it when I see it. But if I have a choice between great story and great characters or great action, I'll go with story and characters every time. And I think what we're seeing now is the WWE shifting and recognizing that they need a little bit better story structure because right now they don't have it. Yeah. The, stru- the structure in the stories right now are an afterthought. Any good movie, any good book, hell, <laughs> any good television commercial has a three-act structure in the story. And I think what we've seen in the WWE for the last couple of years has been athleticism and great action without any regard for story. So that's that would be by one criticism, but I'm sure that they're going to adjust eventually. Yeah, sure. And if I've got time to just ask one more question, is I uh, just going to ask you about TNA, because I know you had some involvement with that in for a while, and you know, I quite liked it for a while. had great talent. I really liked uh, seeing Mick Foley get to the sting. I thought that was really cool. Uh, just wondering, did you think it ever had a chance of being like a big contender against the WWE? Absolutely not. The management, no. the owners uh, of TNA didn't want to invest any money into the property. They didn't really want to. It was, let me sum this up. Um, it was a vanity project. Mm-hmm. It was, it, no, no, the ownership of TNA never took it seriously. Mm-hmm. And it was nothing more than, than a vanity project. Okay, well, I'll have to research that a bit more. I've only seen a few matches, so I don't know a whole bunch, but I'll take your word for that one. But uh, thanks so much for taking your time out to talk with me today. I know you've got a few more interviews scheduled, but uh, it's been really cool seeing some that I've, uh, you know, back in the days, I used to actually have to wake up in the middle of the night to record Nitro 
or I'd get my parents to do it for me, and now I'm talking to Eric Bishop. So it's so cool. Uh, thanks so much for talking to me today. Great, and I look forward to seeing you when I get to Australia. Awesome. Well, have a great tour, hon. See you then. All right, my man. Thank you.